bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name, regardless of what situation you find yourself in today. God has done so much for us, and we have so many reasons to be grateful this morning. If you have your copy of God's Word with you, I invite you to turn in there with me to John chapter 9. John chapter 9. I trust that all of you are there already. For the purpose of our discussion, we will be reading and reviewing together John chapter 9 in its entirety. All of 41 verses. Central, the word of God for the people of God. Jesus heals the man born blind. John 9, 1 through 41. As he, Jesus, went along, he saw a man blind from birth. The disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus said, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. After saying this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means scent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was, others said no, he only looks like him, but he himself insisted, I am the man. How then were your eyes opened, they asked. The man they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed, and then I could see. Where is this man, they asked him. I don't know. They, don't, they, they brought to the Pharisees the man who had been blind. Now, the day on which Jesus made the mud and opened the man's eyes was a Sabbath. Therefore, the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He put mud in my eyes, and I washed, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others asked, How can a sinner form these signs? So they were divided. Then they turned again to the blind man. What have you to say about him? It was your eyes he opened. He is a prophet. They still did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they sent for the man's parents. Is this your son? Is this the one you say was born blind? How is it that now he can see? We know that this he is our son, and we know he was born blind. But how he can see now, or who opened his eyes, we don't know. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders who already had decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. That is why his parents said, he is of age, ask him. The second time they, the Pharisees, summoned the man who had been blind. Give glory to God by telling the truth. We know this man is a sinner. Whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? I have told you already, and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? They hurled insults at him and said, You are this fellow's disciple. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses, but as for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. Now that is remarkable. We don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly person who does his will. Nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. But this man were not from God, 
He could do nothing. You were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture at us? And they threw him out. Jesus heard that they had thrown him out. And when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? Tell me so that I may believe in him. You have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. Then the man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. Jesus said, For judgment I have come into this world, so that the blind will see, and those who see will become blind. Some Pharisees who were with him heard him say this and asked, What? Are we blind too? Jesus said, If you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim you can see, your guilt remains. May, May the, the Lord, Lord add, add a blessing, blessing to, to the reading of his word. Will you pray with me? Father God, give us eyes to see. Help that you would be exalted as your word is explained. And we pray this in Jesus' name and all who are God's people said. Amen. They didn't get what they signed up for. It is known as the Tuskegee Experiment. It was the infamous clinical study conducted for over a 40-year period between 1932 and 1972. The study was designed to discover how untreated syphilis affected African-American males. The theory was that black men experienced different complications as a result of the disease compared to their white counterparts. Why this study was necessary, we still don't know. But in order to prove their theory, the United States Public Health Service needed guinea pigs, a group of African-American males who had previously contracted syphilis and were willing to allow the disease to remain in their body untreated while doctors studied them. Who would sign up for this? Doctors found their willing lab rats in the rural South. When a group of 600 African American men signed up to be part of this study, 399 of which had previously contracted syphilis. Only when they signed up to be part of this study, they didn't know that they were signing up to be part of this study. They were told that they were being given free medical treatment, free meals, and that by agreeing to sign up to be a part of this special project that was going on, they would receive free burial. Many of these men had never received medical treatment a day in their lives, and, and the prospect of, of being treated by doctors was, was so encouraging to them that they signed up without asking any questions. They, they were told that the doctors would treat them in order to make them better. But the reality was that these men were never treated, they were simply studied. James Jones, author of the excellent history on this subject, writes that this was the longest non-therapeutic experiment on human beings in medical history. 15 years into the study, it was discovered that penicillin was the proper treatment for syphilis. But these men were never administered penicillin. They were simply expected to live with the disease while doctors studied them. And in the end, 28 of the men died directly as a result of the syphilis. 100 were dead because of related complications. 40 of their wives had been infected and 19 of their children were born with congenital syphilis. These men signed up for one thing, but they got something completely different. They, they didn't get what they signed up for. That's how many of us this morning feel about the Christian life, that we are not getting what we signed up for. 
many of us thought that be, becoming a, tri a Christian, we were signing up for, for a life of unending joy, where God promised to us to bless us with material prosperity, to, to bless our going in and our coming out, but, but that's not what we have received. Rather, our, our Christian experience has been one of suffering, one of pain. We've had to cry ourselves to sleep at times, and this is not what you signed up for. If this describes you this morning, then, then allow me to clarify something. If you feel that the Christian life is not what you're signed is not what you signed up for that that you're not getting what you had hoped for it it's not because god has pulled some divine bait and switch it's not because god has somehow lured you into the christian life by using deceptive promises it's because you you, you didn't read the fine print when, when you signed up to be a christian when when you put your name on the contract, you, you weren't signing up for God to bless you in every way imaginable. What you were signing up for was for God to use you in any way imaginable. That the Christian life, committing to the Christian life means that you are committing to allowing God to use your life in any way he seems fit to bring himself glory. This is the message, I believe, of John chapter 9. John chapter 9 is, is the second of two parallel healing accounts, the, the first of which we studied last week in, in John chapter 5. There are a number of similarities that link these two healing accounts. Both accounts happen in Jerusalem. Both encounters seem at first incidental until we realize that this was part of God's grand design. Both accounts happened during the celebration of a feast day. Both accounts happened when the victims, both accounts happened, the victims in both accounts have, have, have had to suffer for an extended period of time. The lame man in John chapter 5 had to suffer for 38 years, and the blind man in John chapter 9 was born blind. Both involve knowledge of the victim's past that Jesus somehow knows. Both healings involve a pool. Both healings happened on a Sabbath. Both healings led to further controversy. But whereas with the lame man in John chapter 5, we see in his life an example of counterfeit faith and inauthentic discipleship. With the blind man in John chapter 9, we see an example of authentic faith and what it means to be a genuine disciple. The encounter happens as Jesus and the disciples just happen to be traveling along on a road in Jerusalem. There they encounter what the Bible tells us is a man born blind. How the disciples and Jesus acquire this knowledge, we do not know, but this knowledge becomes very important to the story overall. This seemingly chance encounter provides for the disciples an opportunity for theological inquiry. There was this deeply held belief in Judaism that God would punish a person for sin. So now the disciples want to clarify one thing. They, they assume that this man was born blind because of some sin someone had committed in his life. They, they simply want to know, whose sin was it, Jesus? Was it this man's sin or was it his parents? They assume like, like Job's friends assumed in the book of John, that someone had to do something in order for this blind man to suffer the way he was suffering. Either his parents, in which case God was visiting his parents' sin on this man, or himself. 
There was a belief in Judaism in that day that someone could sin even in the womb. Therefore, it's not a strange question to ask whether this man sinned in the womb that caused him to, to be blind. Jesus will, will answer their question and he will put aside their theological misunderstanding. He, he clarifies for them that God did not punish this man because of someone's specific sin, not his parents' specific sin, not his own specific sin, that this man's blindness was not punitive. Jesus clarifies uh, this uncomfortable theological notion that God somehow punish us severely because of some specific sin that we've done. It's, it's uncomfortable to think of, of God as, as being so harsh and, and so judgmental. Sin, enters into, sin entered into the world and, and suffering in the, entered into the world, not because of our specific sins, but because of sin in general. Jesus clarifies their theological misunderstanding, but, but the answer that he gives that explains why this man was born blind is perhaps even more uncomfortable than the alternative supplied by the disciples. In the second part of, of verse 3, Jesus explains how this man was born blind. He, he said that God allowed this man to be born blind. He doesn't say that God was, was not involved in it. He just, God was not involved in it in the way the disciples thought he was involved in it. He, he said, God allowed this man to suffer, to be born blind, to, to experience this tragedy, all because God was looking for an opportunity to reveal his glory in this man. Amen. God was looking for an opportunity to display his character, to reveal who he is. And he found that opportunity in the life, in the condition, and in the suffering of this man. Jesus says in verse 3, that God allowed this, this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in his life. The, the works of God are the activity of God that God does to reveal his glory. Everything that God does is so he can reveal himself and reveal his glory, everything from his work in creation. Psalm 19.1 says that the heavens declare the glory of God to his work in salvation. In Ephesians 2, we are told that the reason God saved us in the first place is so that he can put on display the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ. God was looking for a canvas to paint a picture of his glory. And he found that canvas in this man's condition, in this man's tragedy, and this man's suffering. The, the grammatical construction that, that Jesus uses makes this explicit. The so that clause is, is what we refer to in the Greek as a henna plus subjunctive clause. All that means is that it explains the intentions behind an action. Jesus said this happened so that God may display his works in this man. God allowed this to happen so that other people who thought they could see, their eyes would be opened by watching God work in the life of this man. And if that's uncomfortable to you, then then later on in, in John chapter 11, it's going to get even more uncomfortable to you. In John chapter 11, 
Mary and Martha, two people that Jesus loved and had a great relationship with, send word to Jesus that their brother Lazarus is sick. And the Bible tells us that after receiving this news, Jesus waited three more days before journeying another four days to Mary and Martha's house. Why, why did Jesus wait? Jesus' words explains it to us. He said he waited so that the glory of God may be revealed. Jesus waited for Lazarus to die. Jesus waited while Mary and Martha mourned and cried their eyes out. Jesus, Jesus waited so they could grief Mary, Martha, and that whole town, all because Jesus wanted an opportunity to reveal God's glory through the suffering and the death of Lazarus. Jesus, and, 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 and I wish I, I, I could say that, that Jesus' actions here are restricted to the life of, of the man born blind, are restricted to the life of, of Mary and Martha, are restricted to the life of, of Lazarus, but, but, but this is God's plan for all of his people. God is always looking for an opportunity to put on his display his glory so that the world can see it. And God can be glorified in our lives, whether it's through our successes or our sufferings. And, and here's what it means to be a Christian. You agree that you are willing to let God use your life in any way so that his glory will be revealed and displayed, whether it's through your promotion at the job or whether it's through your sickness in the hospital, whether it's through finding financial success or being so broke that you can't believe. You allow God to use your life in whatever way he deems fit in order to bring himself glory. I, I, I knew I wasn't gonna get a lot of amens <laughs> on, on, on that one. <laughs> I, I knew this wasn't gonna be an, but an amen sermon, but, but, but consider this the, the fine print on the contract that you often ignore. Consider this the, 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 the voice of the man who, who comes at the end of those commercials telling you the, the warnings about using such and such a prescription. That, that when you agree to follow Jesus, you don't agree to God blessing you in the city, in the field, blessing your going in and going out. You, you, you agree to let God use your life in any way he sees fit, whether it's in your successes or especially in your suffering to bring himself glory. And, and if you are that person that God selects to suffer so that he can show off, you, you, you know what your response should be? Thank you. Thank you that you chose me to reveal your glory. Paul says in Philippians 1.20 that I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed but have sufficient courage so that now as always Christ will be exalted in my body whether by life or by death. And he then goes on to make that famous statement for me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. If I go on living in my present condition, in jail, not knowing whether I will live or die, Christ will still be glorified by my life. And if I die, it's gain because I get to see Christ 
1 Peter 4.16 says, if someone suffers as a Christian, he is not to be ashamed, but he is to praise God because you bear the name. In Acts chapter 5, Luke records this remarkable story for us. The, The disciples are arrested, imprisoned for preaching the gospel. That night, an angel of the Lord appears in their prison cells, opens the door, and he helps them to escape. The morning, they, the Jewish authorities discovered that the apostles had escaped, but they didn't have to look very hard to find the apostles. The apostles were back doing what landed them in jail in the first place, proclaiming the message of the cross. The, the Jewish authorities, they capture the disciples again. They They interrogate them, they threaten them, they beat them, they threaten them again, and then they release them. And after everything they went through, after being imprisoned, after being beaten, after being threatened, here is the disciples' response in Acts chapter 5, verse 41. They went home rejoicing because they were counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. Disciples rejoice in God using them to reveal his glory, whether it is in their successes or in their suffering. You you already know him. His name is Nick Vujicic. You know him from the Oprah Winfrey show. He, He is the president of a ministry called Life without limbs. He is the president and founder of that ministry because he was born without limbs. His his story is remarkable. He was born without hands and without feet. And he said for for the first part of his life, he, 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 he went through two stages. The first part, suicidal, where, where he just couldn't imagine living life this way. He he prayed that God would would somehow miraculously restore his hands and his feet. He he even made clay hands and and clay feet and, and, and prayed that God would somehow turn these clay hands and clay feet into something that was real. The first part of his life, he 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 spent resenting God for making him this way. He he resented God because he was born this way. But the second part of his life he realized that, that God could gain glory through his condition. He, he said that God allowed him to be born without hands and feet so that he could now be the hands and feet of God. And the second part of his life, he spends rejoicing and trying to bring glory to God in spite of his condition and oftentimes because of his condition. Does that describe you this morning, Central? That that regardless of what you're going through, you want God to use you to bring himself glory. This is what it means to to be a disciple, that that you celebrate however God chooses to to use you to bring glory to himself and, and to reveal himself to the world. And In the first part of our text, Jesus explains the man's condition. In the second part of our text, Jesus will heal the man. The the, the healing is is, is strange because Jesus takes saliva, creates mud with it. Scholars say that that there might have been some healing properties in in the saliva of Jesus, but but however the man was healed, what's significant is that the man was healed. For John, this becomes the sixth sign, sixth of seven signs in John's gospel that that reveals the identity of Jesus. It it points to Jesus as the Messiah. And the significance of this sign is that in all of the Bible, we, we have never seen anything like this. Even the man will later exclaim, no one has ever heard of someone healing a man who was born blind. The the difficulty of this miracle 
is designed to impress the reader and say something about who Jesus is. The miracle itself is difficult. Some would say impossible on one hand, but on the other hand, nothing is too hard for our God. If God can heal a man who was born blind, what issue do you have in your life today that God can't deal with? The sixth sign in John's gospel will teach us that nothing is impossible for God, that, that God can do anything. In the first part of our text, Jesus sees the, the man's condition as an opportunity for God to, to reveal himself and obtain glory. The healing becomes the means by which God brings glory to himself, and, and the man's life becomes the demonstration of God's glory. The man's life becomes the demonstration of God's glory. After his healing, the man will have three separate encounters with three different groups. The first encounter that he has after his healing is with his friends, his neighbors, those who knew him most, if not all, of his life. And in our text, we are told that despite the fact that his, his visit, his appearance hasn't changed, his neighbors, the people he grew up with, his friends, do not recognize him. It, it's almost comical, the exchange that takes place. Some claimed that he, that he was. Others said, no, he only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I am that man. I, I, I don't look different. I am him. But the fact that his neighbors, his friends, his, his family members had difficulty recognizing him tells us something about the nature of people. People in this man's life and in your life find it difficult to believe that you've changed. The, the, the reason why they have difficulty recognizing this man is that he's no longer humbled, he's no longer debased, and he's no longer begging. If he had been more of what he was, they would have recognized him. If he was begging for money more than ever, if he was more debased than ever, if he was more humbled than ever, they would have been, oh, there you go right there. <laughs> That's the man who had been born blind. But since he has changed, since he is transformed, since he is no longer what he used to be, they find it difficult to recognize him. And their inquiry with him ends when they ask the man who did it and express a desire to meet the man. D.A. Carson comments that his friends ask to meet the man who transformed the man's life, not because they have a desire to check his story, but because they have a natural desire to meet the man that performed such an outstanding, such an astounding act. That his transformation creates in the lives of his friends and in his neighbors a desire to meet the man who transformed him. God is glorified in our lives when people see evidence of our transformation. Our transformation may be less miraculous than this man's transformation, but it should be no less dramatic. People shouldn't be able to recognize you from the person you were before you met Jesus. When you encounter people who knew you from back when, the same reaction that they had to their encounter with the blind man is the same reaction that people should have to you. 
And when they see the transformation that God has wrought in your life, just like with the blind man, they should ask to meet the man who is responsible because God should be glorified if there is true transformation in your life by the story of your transformation. I, I, I grew up watching Good Times. Good Times was my, my, my favorite sitcom of all time. I, I, I watched every episode of Good Times uh, from before James died till after James died to when Thelma got married to the football player and he hurt his knee to the last episode when they finally moved out to projects in Chicago. But one of my all-time favorite episodes was, was during the first season. It's called Springtime in the Ghetto. It was the one where, where Florida had entered her home in a cleaning contest and, and the person who had the cleanest apartment in the project won some very significant award. And Florida spent the, the whole day cleaning her apartment. She, she, she put fancy decorations on the wall. She, she brought plants and, and put them in strategic places. She cleaned the oven. The house was spotless. And just minutes before the, the people who were to judge the cleanest house were to come in, Michael brought home, you remember that episode? He, he brought home Ned the Wino. Y'all remember that episode? <laughs> Ned the Wino came in the house and, and he said, Mom, this is an opportunity for, for us to clean this man up. And, 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 and the family disputed with Michael saying, it's impossible to clean up Ned the Wino, but, but Florida gave in and, and she quickly cleaned up Ned the wino, they, 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 they made him take a shower, they, they put on him a, a new suit, and they sat him on the couch. The judges came over to, to judge who had the cleanest house. They took one quick look around and declared that Florida was the winner. When, 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 they asked for an, when Florida asked for an explanation, you know, you didn't, you didn't see the oven. You, you didn't see how I cleaned up the oven. You didn't even go into the bathroom to see how I cleaned up the bathroom. And, and, and there were other homes that, that you didn't go check out. How do you know that my home is the cleanest? And they said, we, we, we don't need to look at your house to determine that you're the winner. All we needed to see is how you cleaned up Ned the wine. <laughs> Come here, Central. God has put on display his glory for the world to see the heavens declare the glory of God. But, but all people really need to see is how God cleaned you up <laughs> so they can witness God's glory on display. Demonstration of God's glory in the life of, of the man who was once blind is the fact that he is now transformed. Our transformation reveals God's glory. His second encounter happens with a, with a group of, of Pharisees who interrogate the man to find out the legitimacy of his story. During their interrogation that happens in two separate episodes, once before they go to they go to his parents to challenge his parents, and once after their challenging of his parents. They question the blind man and try to get him to recant his story. But instead of recanting his story, his story becomes more firm, highlighting, highlighted by the fact what he says in verse 25. One thing I do know, I was blind but now I see. What, what's remarkable about his story is how it compares to other people in the Gospel of John who were afraid of the threats of Jewish authorities and therefore would not tell their story. In comparison to the lame man in John chapter 5, he, he, the lame man refuses to acknowledge who Jesus is but rather is afraid of the threats of the Jewish authorities. And, and even his parents who, who hear who, who Jewish authorities threaten and, and they refuse to acknowledge the fact that Jesus is the one 
who performed this miracle, and because he is the one, he's worthy of our worship and our praise. The, the blind man's testimony is remarkable because it comes in the face of intimidation and possible persecution. The blind man refuses to let go of his testimony regardless of what happens to us, to him. All of which re reminds us that God is glorified when we hold on to our testimony. There, there are some of us here this morning who are quick to shout how we love Jesus in church, how we adore Jesus, how, how we're here to worship Jesus. But, but the minute we, we leave the, the comforts of this sanctuary, the minute we leave the, the presence of other Christians, we are quiet about our faith. We are not willing to testify about the goodness of God if it's in an uncomfortable situation. This does not describe the blind man. The blind man held on to his testimony in the face of persecution central. Are you like that? Are, 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 are you like Paul, not ashamed of the gospel because of the power of the gospel? Or are you like the, the lame man and the blind man parents who refuse to testify because of fear? Disciples are those who hold on to their testimony. And even in the wake of intimidation and persecution, reveal their testimony because God is glorified through their testimony. One, one last thing. He has an encounter with his neighbors, and he reveals God's glory through his transformation. He, he has an encounter with the Pharisees, and he reveals God's glory through his testimony. And, and finally, he has an encounter with Jesus and he reveals God's glory through his worship of the Christ. When Jesus finally reveals that he is the Son of Man, we are told that the blind man in verse 38 believed in Jesus and he worshiped him. His reaction is spontaneous and not coached. Jesus didn't have to tell him, fall down and worship me. There didn't need to be a, a choir director encouraging the man to worship Jesus. The, the preacher didn't have to get loud so that the man can worship Jesus. Once the man discovered who Jesus was, he worshiped. You missed it, Central. <laughs> the man's reaction to the discovery of who Jesus is is a spontaneous spontaneous outburst of worship, not coerced like I'm doing now. <laughs> he didn't need music to worship. He didn't need a, a, a choir director to egg him on to worship. He simply encountered Jesus and began to worship. Disciples glorify God by their spontaneous, uncoerced worship of God, and they worship simply because God is worthy. <laughs> Didn't need to be in church, had an encounter with God, worship. It, it, it didn't need to happen in, in an appropriate place, he had an encounter with God, he worshiped. Didn't need to be around other people. He had an encounter with God. He worshiped. What happens, Central, when, when you encounter God in your quiet time, or you just see evidence of God around you? Do you take time to, to worship God because he is worthy? <laughs> that there doesn't need for you to be coerced, that your, your worship is spontaneous and real. I, I read this story uh, about a king who was, going to village, who was going to visit a village in Spain. That, that village in Spain was known for its great tasting homemade wine. In fact, just about every home in that village 
had a wine recipe that was said to be world class. And because they knew the, the king couldn't taste all of their wines separately, what they decided to do was, was make a batch of their best wine, put it all in a vial, and serve that to the king. They all agreed to do that. They put their supposed best wine in a vial, and when the king got it, he tasted the wine, and he said the wine tastes like water. H had someone performed a, a, a Jesus miracle at Cana in reverse? No, that's not what happened. Other people, when hearing that someone else was pouring in their best wine, decided that they would pour into the vial watery wine and thinking that other people's wines would accommodate it. But instead, not one villager, not two villagers, but all the villagers decided that this was the appropriate course of action. They, they didn't put in their best wine. They all put in their worst wine. So all the king received was watery wine. When you come to worship God, do you count on other people <laughs> to supply the worship that God deserves, or are you putting your best wine into the vial? God is so worthy of worship, whether no one else does, you should worship God because he's been so good to you. Will you pray with me? Father, use our lives to bring glory to you in whatever way you see necessary, Lord God, whether it's through our suffering and our success. Father, we want to be a people to reveal who you are. Use us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.